Well, Warren, you know, we've been talking about the fact that we both live in Japan and that we're both from Western countries. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, how do you feel about uh, Western eating utensils compared to Japanese eating utensils? Well, you know, even in Japan, they, they use Western utensils sometimes. Um, but overall, I do like chopsticks. I, I think it's very handy. Um, it's just easier to, to pick up certain things. When I, when I first came to Japan and saw people eating salad with chopsticks, I thought it was very strange. But if I try to eat it with a fork now, it's actually very difficult to pick up things like lettuce. Mm. And uh, I prefer using chopsticks for things like that. When you first started using chopsticks, did you get hand cramps? Um, not so much because I, I, I can't recall when I started using them, but I actually, I became comfortable with them before coming to Japan. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, what about, uh, the sleeping? How do you sleep? Do you prefer a bed or do you prefer the Japanese style futon? Well, it's funny you say that. Um, at first I, I hated the idea of this thin little mattress, mm -hmm. Um, but I do find it's actually quite nice for my back. Mm. Um, I actually prefer it to Western beds because it's better for my back. But I, I don't like sleeping on the floor. I like being higher up. So a high futon. If, if I could get like, a, you know, tatami mat that's raised with a futon yes. mattress on top, that would be best for me. Mm. You know, I think I've seen things like that in the stores, platform bed with tatami. Oh, that sounds nice. I should look for that. Yeah, I should find one for you and point you in that direction. Well, what about bathing? Uh, the Japanese are famous for their onsens and the way they bathe. So mm -hmm. do you prefer a Japanese-style uh, bathing situation or a Western-style shower and well, I actually much prefer the Japanese style now. When I go back home, I find it quite difficult. Um, I, I like uh, to be able to clean myself before going into the bathtub. Mm, that's a good, a good thing. Mm -hmm. I, I do enjoy that as well. Uh, what about the custom of taking your shoes off uh, before going into a house? Well, that doesn't bother me too much. When growing up in Canada, I always took my shoes off um, coming inside anyways, I, I don't think it's as much of a ritual in Canada, but many people do it just to keep a clean house. But sometimes if I run out and I forget something like my car keys and I want to just run back inside, I'll tend to want to keep my shoes on rather than taking them on and off every single time. Okay, tell me, confess now, do you sometimes keep your shoes on and go into the house? Yeah, sometimes I have, but I, I've caught my wife doing it a couple times too, and she's Japanese, so hey, I guess I'm not that bad. I don't think so. I do it too. <laughs> what about sitting on the floor versus sitting in chairs? Which do you prefer? Oh, again, I, I really dislike sitting on the floor. It isn't very comfortable for me. I'm a little bit tall. I have long legs and they, I don't seem to have a place to put my legs when I'm on the floor. Usually my legs will fall asleep quickly and my back will start to bother me, so I, oh. I prefer to sit up in a chair. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, well, I guess my last question is... I guess my last question it refers to eating habits, well, meals and how they're served. Do you prefer to eat meals that are served to you individually or do you prefer to eat... Uh, and share your food? Well, that's a good question, but I don't know if I have a preference. I like the idea of eating all sorts of different things, so it can be fun eating in a, in a Japanese style sometimes, but there are times where I do like to just have my, my own meal in front of me as well. So, Antoinette, you've been living in Japan for a while now, right? Yes, that's right. Huh. Well, can you tell me, do you like to use chopsticks or forks and knives more? It depends on what I'm eating, really. Uh, for the most part, I enjoy using chopsticks. They are easy to use. I don't have to worry about cutting anything, and especially if I'm eating Japanese food, which tends to be chopped in small pieces, small bite-sized pieces, chopsticks are perfect. But when I'm eating Western food or spaghetti, I prefer using Western-style utensils. Oh, okay, that makes sense. What about uh, sleeping? Do you like to sleep on like a Western bed or, or a Japanese futon? Actually, it depends on the season. 
In Why summer, don't? well, in summer, I prefer sleeping on a futon. It seems cooler than a bed. But in winter, I love a cozy, plush bed with lots of pillows and quilts or duvets. And yeah, I well, like to feel that cozy. That sounds nice. Okay. Mm. How about um, having shoes on or off in the house? Mm, I like to go barefoot. Well, with socks. My feet get cold. Oh, do you use slippers? No. Oh, okay. I find slippers uncomfortable unless they are the kind that fit your foot. They're not actually the correct size for my foot. So. Oh, I see. So Japanese slippers are, are different size for they're, you? They're one size fits all, and I just feel uh, like uh, just kicking them off any right. time. Yeah. Oh, okay. How about, uh, you know, in Japan, a lot of times people sit on the floor, um, but you don't really do that very much in, in the United States. Do you like sitting in chairs or, or in the floor more? Mm, I like both, actually. Again, it depends on the season. The floor is so nice and cool in summer, and I like just, just feeling that coolness. But in winter, I want fabric underneath me, and I want cushions. That tends to um, act, uh, provide a barrier for cold wind. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Eating out is a little different, too. Uh, I think in, in Japan, you tend to share all the meals that you have, but maybe back home, you usually just buy one meal. That's true. Uh, maybe I'm a germ-phobic American. I don't know. I like eating my own food. I don't oh. like to share. If it's one huge serving plate that's meant for several people, then fine, but I like just having my own plate of food. Oh, okay. Um, what about... Uh, having a shower or a bath. I think in Japan they usually um, have like a detachable shower head and, and uh, you can shower yourself before going into a bath. Mm. What do you prefer? Well, I like showers either way, as long as the water is hot. Uh, whether it's detachable or not, as long as the water is hot, I like showers. And I like having water run down my body. That's a pleasant feeling so but I also like sitting in a hot tub of water but well, not for too long what about the the bathtubs because I think they're they're different sizes aren't they they are I like the fact that Japanese baths allow you to sit in water up to your neck but I also like the fact that western style baths allow you to recline in the water right you can stretch so out you more? can stretch out yeah oh, okay I see uh, that's a hard, hard call. So, Jeremy, uh, you mentioned earlier that you've been back to Canada with your baby. Mm -hmm. How was that experience? Well, I mean, until you fly with a, with a toddler, you really not, never get to appreciate all of those times that you flew across the ocean, uh, you know, watching movies or reading magazines <laughs> or just sleeping on the flight because those days are over. Wow. Um, I mean, it, it's it's not that bad, but when you're on the plane, you say never again. Mm. Um, I remember about halfway into a 10-hour Trans-Pacific flight, I thought, well, I can maybe do this every three years, but <laughs> not more than once a year, for sure. I mean, first of all, our boy was, was bigger than most children at, for his age, so he was about one years old. And, um, you know, they have these uh, bassinets that you're, you're allowed to put your child in, and, you know, the baby will hopefully sleep for a while. Mm -hmm. So the stewardess sets up the bassinet, we're all ready to put him in there, and then she says, how old is he? And he was... 12 kilos, and this was for 11.5 maximum, oh, and they no. wouldn't let us put him in there, oh. so they had to take the whole thing apart, and basically, uh, we had to find some way to have him sleep on our laps for oh, the next wow. nine hours, so, I mean, you know, one-year-olds like to crawl around, they like to scream, they like to cry, um, other people on the flight don't like that so much, so, you know, it's it's... It's basically every minute of silence you just savor mm. and just pray that this will keep going and it never <laughs> does. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, once he falls asleep and and uh, the plane's quiet and they turn off the lights, then, you know, it's okay. But it's too long. It's too long for a one-year-old. So, um, 
I, I can maybe manage it once a year, but mm-hmm. that's that's about it. Mm. I remember my sister, she has two kids, and she told me a story a few years back when one of her daughters was still a toddler, and they went to Disneyland mm. from Canada, and she said it was just horrible, and they would never do it again. And I just smiled. I, I didn't have that experience. I was just thinking, what could be so bad about it? Yeah. Well, hearing your story now, wow, I can only imagine. Well, I've, I think that, Actually, most people, most passengers on a flight are usually quite understanding. Mm. And I think it's just, you know, in the parent's head that everybody's judging them, everybody's looking at them. Um, Because, you know, I get so worried about what other people are thinking that I'm Mm. inconveniencing others that I just work myself up so much. And my wife's the same way. But, you know, talking, actually, we did have people say to us, like, um, you know, don't worry about it. Aww. And they they would just go out of their way to say, oh, what a cute baby and stuff like that. So I think people were kind of aware of how stressful it is for parents. And they just, you know, some people actually uh, make an effort to make parents feel like everybody's not silently judging them or okay. maybe not even silently. <laughs> <laughs> not saying anything. If you had an advice, one advice to give to a parent that would travel with a child in the future, what would you tell them? My best advice is if you can fly uh, in the morning, so after baby wakes up and you have your breakfast and your flight's maybe at, I don't know, 9 or 10 in the morning, I think that works out best if it's, a, say, okay. a 10-hour flight because you'll you'll land and it'll be probably around bedtime, like it's okay. normal bedtime. The first time we did it, the flight was in the late evening. So basically he'd been up all day mm. and then there was another 10 hours on top of that. Mm. So... Uh, you know, when we landed, the readjustment to his, his normal schedule was really, really difficult. But when we flew in the morning and uh, it was a 10-hour flight, when we landed, he just basically went to sleep okay. uh, like a normal schedule. So that's a small thing, but it really makes a big difference. Thank you. Okay. Jeremy, I, I heard you have a new baby. Congrats on that. Thanks. So how has uh, fatherhood changed you in any way uh you know it's changed me probably in every way Mm -hmm. um you know when you think of how your life is different it's basically from when you wake up until well you eventually get to go to sleep (laughs) (laughs) everything is different um but you know everything about it is positive even things that you'd think would annoy you um, actually aren't really that annoying. Like mm-hmm. having a a toddler come and wake you up at six o'clock in the morning when you've um, when you've got a cold and you've taken a bunch of sleeping mm. medication the night before, <laughs> like which happened in this morning. <laughs> and even that, having a toddler wake you up and just looking at you and laughing, it's it's awesome. It mm. really it really is awesome. So you know, I always kind of worried. Before, when I, when, you know, when I was thinking about having a kid, about all these things, oh, I can't go out at night, or I'm going to have to wake up so early in the morning, and I'm going to be woken up in the middle of the night by a screaming child. All of that stuff really doesn't bother me. Mm. It, it's, it just, you know, it's part of the, the experience. And yeah, sometimes maybe I'd like to sleep a little bit longer, but yeah, waking up and then having a little guy sit on my lap while. Uh, he plays with the remote control and changes <laughs> channels over and over again. I mean, that's that's somehow a very very enjoyable experience. But wow. um, you know, it's it's you get to see a a little person change every day mm. and start figuring things out. And of course, every person, every parent thinks that their child is the smartest child in the world. <laughs> he can turn off and on the the light switch. You know, <laughs> but it's those types of things that you just marvel at. So. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can I can say like most people that it's everything about it is is very positive, but it's often just the really really small things that mm-hmm. that uh, make you appreciate okay. this little little wonder. Mm-hmm. And looking back on the experience now, what are some things that you would uh, wish you had known? Oh. You wish you had known before your little boy came along. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know. I was so stressed out for the first couple of weeks mm. after he was born and from the from the moment he was born um until you know he came back home and then for the first number of weeks that he was home we basically just hovered over him for weeks and 
um, you know, of course you have to be protective and careful of a, of a newborn baby, but not everything mm. was as serious as we thought it was. And, you know, crying, we were worried about waking up our neighbors or we were worrying that, you know, something was seriously wrong. Babies cry. And <laughs> if, you, if you really get stressed out about it, then you're going to make your life miserable. Mm. So, you know, having done it once, just realizing that, you know, kids cry, kids get sick, kids throw up, kids need their, you know, their nappies changed. Mm. Um, I would just take a deep breath if I had to have to do it again and just realize, okay, this is just part of the experience and uh, you just got to roll with it. So, Okay, that's great. So, Amy, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day and they, they told me that you'd had uh, quite a number of like um, interesting little odd jobs. Um, so, like, I'm interested. Could you uh, tell me a bit about that? I don't know how odd, how odd they were. I don't know. When I was in university, um, part-time jobs, I used to work in restaurants and, you know, usual stuff, restaurants. And I think my favourite was working in a nightclub. Um, it was a really, really big nightclub. And I used to work on the floor, just kind of cleaning up, um, looking after all the drunk patrons and on my first night there, it was it was actually one of my favourite DJs was on, so that was great. Um, I got to listen to really good music whilst finding money on the floor <laughs> and cleaning up after folk. It was really good. You found some money on the floor? Yeah, you know, it was a busy club, really, really full. A good couple of thousand people in there. And um, I guess people were doing whatever they were doing and they would drop big wads of cash and because I was the person to clean up all the, the glass bottles, then I would find the wads of cash on the floor. So it was it was good. I'd get my wages, I'd get tips, and then I would get my own personal tips from finding <laughs> finding money on the floor. So like you must have found like a, a whole range of like you know, different things. Like what else did you what else did you find? Yeah, little wraps of things and uh, packets of things. Um yeah, I, mean, I had to. I had to work hard for the money. It wasn't easy uh, because the place was full, absolutely rammed of people. Everybody's incredibly drunk or whatever, and um, they're all just wanting to dance and have a good time. And I have to make sure there's no broken glass um, for safety reasons, obviously. So I'm pushing my way through the crowd and keeping my eyes on the floor constantly with a torch. And uh, alongside the broken glass that I would sweep up would be. Yeah, wads of cash, sometimes little purses, little bags, things like that. When I found, like, identification for things, when it was a purse, I would, you know, do the right thing with it, hand it in. But if it was just a, a wad up, like, a rolled up set of notes, I would just put them in my pocket for for me, basically. Yeah, it's difficult to know what to do with cash because, you know, you hand it in to someone who, mm -hmm. well, it's cash, isn't it? So, I know. Yeah. Yeah. When I found, um, I remember finding some uh, driving license and uh, student ID and I took, it was actually the same university that I went to at the time and I just took it to uni when I was going in during the week and I handed it in to make sure that it, it got back to the owner because, you know, that's the worst thing about when you lose your purse or your wallet, um, the cash you can kind of just say goodbye to. It's a given, really, that it's going to be gone. But it's your ID and your cards and everything. It's such mm. a hassle trying to get them back again. So I wanted to make sure that whoever, whatever drunken idiot dropped them in that club, that it got yeah. back to their hands safely. Oh, that's nice. So you're a thief with heart, then? I'm not a thief. <laughs> an opportunist. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's on the floor. I'm pulling your leg. I'm pulling your leg. No, I would have done the same. So, Paul, what's the most memorable job experience that you have? Hmm. Well, I think the most memorable must have, um, is the uh, volunteering um, time that I spent in Australia. And um, I was up in the northeastern corner where there's um, well, a relatively small rainforest. And I was helping with a research station uh, that's located in the rainforest. Um, so 
<clears throat> we do a range of different things, um, going from um, trying to control uh, coconuts, coconut trees. Control? Yeah, because, like, believe it or not, you, you imagine these kind of tropical paradises to, to have coconut trees. But they're actually very invasive and they're not native to that, that area. Oh. And basically, if you let a, um, you know, a population of coconuts, coconut trees to go out of control, mm. nothing else can grow. Oh. Uh, you know, they drop their fawns and they, they drop their, obviously, the coconuts. Mm -hmm. And uh, nothing else can grow. So you basically lose... Uh, a lot of the native species there. So trying to keep them under control. Uh, we There was also um, caring for bats that had been uh, orphaned. Uh, sometimes they're born, you know, with um, physical disabilities that mean they can't survive in the wild. So right. Like a sanctuary it's then? It's like a sanctuary, yeah, yeah. So they take care of... What size of bats? Like Indiana Jones uh, style? Fruit bats. What size are they? Uh, they're pretty, like one. once they spread, they're like little monkeys with uh -huh. big wings. Yeah, so what's their wingspan like? Um, how, <laughs> let's say, maybe, I guess, up to probably four, four feet. Does that sound too much? Is that about a meter? Yeah, they're side. like the, the, some of the big, the the big, you know, the big dudes. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they've got a huge wingspan. Uh, the only bats I've seen in real life are really tiny. They're just like little uh, mice. The micro bats. They're, they're like yeah. little birds, you know? Yeah, you see them yeah. flying around and you think, oh, that's birds. No, the bats. Mm. So these guys sound pretty big. Mm. But they're completely like um, herbivorous. They only eat fruit. Right. So like they're really, you know. Do they eat the coconuts? <laughs> Uh, well, the coconuts are kind of tough for them to yes. to get into, you know. You need to be able to make a hole, I suppose, of course, to get yeah. there. Yeah, but they eat all mostly like fleshy fruits, you know, apples or whatever they can get. Really, mm -hmm. berries, and they're really important for spreading because obviously they eat the the flesh mm -hmm. of the fruit, but they don't eat the seeds. Okay, so they just kind of pass through them. Okay. And they're really useful for dispersing seeds. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, rainforests, uh, regeneration, um, they're very important, you know, animals. So look, they're like the, the big bumblebees of the rainforests then? Yeah, I guess you could look at it like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was an interesting uh, volunteering kind of... Um, Odd job that I had, I suppose. Yeah, that sounds yeah, really good. Yeah. Really cool. I really like to go back there someday. So we were talking about climates, Amy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are there any sort of climates that you you'd like to live in? I would like to live in Iceland or Scandinavia. <laughs> Interesting. Um, why, why, why would you like to, to live in, in that sort of climate? Um, I, the snow is just so beautiful. And my image of those countries is that their infrastructure is sufficient enough to keep you warm when you're inside, you know. Um, but outside is just so beautiful. The snow is amazing. It quietens everything. I think it's glorious. <laughs> mm. Just really like it. Um, I used to ski when I was younger, so I always I like skiing and I like the hills and yeah, this snow on hills is just beautiful for me. How about yeah. you? Um, well, I I love snow too, but I don't like it when it gets all slushy and sloppy. You know, and it's like and your feet are freezing and mm. you know I think like the ideal of snow. Mm. is really appealing mm. um, I'm not sure about you know uh, living in it I prefer um, I don't know maybe the the climate of like um, southern Italy kind of Mediterranean mm -hmm. climate I think that would be really quite pleasant you know mm. uh, not too hot um, by the sea um, Although, yeah, in the summer, it does get hot. But I don't think there's the humidity like here in Japan. 
Right, I was thinking about that. What mm. kind of heat is it? Is it a dry heat? Or it's a, is it I think a... it's a drier heat, yeah. yeah. Mm. Whereas the heat, obviously, we get here is... Yeah. Unbearable at times, right? It's, yeah. It's, mm. Yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> mm. Yep. So... Um, what's the what's the the highest temperature? Um, what's the range of temperatures? Do you think in southern Italy that kind of climate? Do you know? I'm not sure. I guess maybe at this time of year it starts getting up towards uh, twenty degrees C. That's nice. And then it? I think it does. You know, places like Sicily, I think it does get pretty hot. Uh huh. Probably like um, you know, um, high thirties. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So. And then I think the winters are probably quite mild, um, mm. unless you're you're up in the north of Italy, of course, near the mountains. Yeah. But I think down in the south, I think it remains kind of pretty um, mild, you know. Uh huh. Mm. If it's in the med, then it must my yeah my image of that. I've never been to Italy, so I don't know. But I've been to the south of France, and that that got really hot. That was a nice temperature, and it was dry, and. Yeah, the night time wasn't too hot either. It was really nice during the day. That was a nice climate, I think. 